It's always a great pleasure to be here. Thanks for inviting me, and it's great to be here on the 70th birthday of the country. It's been a very pleasurable visit so far. Okay, so the density conjectures that I want to describe are replacements of the Ramanujan conjecture, but they, in some sense, are not just a replacement because we don't know how to prove the general Ramanujan conjectures, but because the general Ramanujan conjectures, if formulated naively, are false, and I'll get back to Alex but later, the word false there, <laughs> um, and these density conjectures that I want to formulate, I assume, or I'm going to conjecture, are always true, and they are substitute. But let me start with the density hypothesis they usually called. I don't know why the difference between hypothesis, conjecture, uh, classical in the theory of zeta functions. So I'll just stick to the Riemann zeta function. So you probably all heard of the Riemann hypothesis. I won't review it here. It's about where the zeros of the zeta function are. Suppose I'm trying to count prime numbers in intervals. So suppose a big number x. I'll take a dyadic interval 2x. And I'll look at x, x plus h. And I ask, is there a prime in the interval x, x plus h, where I want h to be quite small? So between x and 2x, just by prime number theorem or something, they're about x over log x cap, uh, primes. And you're going to put these primes, things of put, putting balls in little boxes. Do they cover all the little boxes of size, maybe log to a power? It's a conjecture of Cromero that the difference between consecutive primes is at most log p to a power. I won't worry about the power here. So <coughs> that's an interesting problem, extremely difficult. The Riemann hypothesis, which counts for you the number of primes less than x with a sharp remainder, if you assume the Riemann hypothesis, would tell you that between x and x plus square root x, there always is a prime. So if these intervals are sufficiently long, we don't know anything close to that at this point, but that would what follows from the Riemann hypothesis. But what I want to do, and that's one of the powers of the density hypothesis, which I'll state in a moment, and where it can be a full substitute for the Riemann hypothesis, is if you're shooting for equidistribution in sets so small that you have no right really to hit everybody, but you can try to hit almost everybody. So let's look at the variance of x, which would be 1 over x, the integral from x to 2x, of the sum of the primes between x and x plus h. Uh, we always count primes with weight log p, so I count the number of primes there. Because I put the weight log p here, if these primes were very well distributed, I should expect h, uh, because of the log, the density is now 1, basically, so this um, h is going to be reasonably large, log to a power maybe. So I look at this thing, I square it, and I integrate that. So this is the variance of the fluctuations of the count of the number of primes in an interval as I vary from x to 2x. H, h is, h will, I, I want to see, so h will be uh, somewhere, it's going to be quite small, but you can think of it as be between x and certainly bigger than log x, because if it's as small as log x, I don't have enough primes to cover. All right, so it's somewhere there. So there's an old, so this is called, these variance computations, which uh, would, if this variance, so suppose there are no primes in the interval here, then this would be h squared times the number of intervals which have no primes. So if I can get the variance to be smaller than h squared, I'll be saying that there are primes in most intervals, which is the statistical statement we're interested in here. So Selberg, many things start with him, I don't know, in the 40s, prove the following. Assume the Riemann hypothesis for the, for the Riemann zeta function. Then V of x is less than a constant times h log x squared. Sorry about my handwriting. That's an upper bound, assuming the Riemann hypothesis. So, 
This is for every h bigger than log x, yeah. not too small. So this already implies, that under the Riemann hypothesis, that almost all intervals of length h, which is bigger than, so as long as h over log x squared goes to infinity, which is plenty good, then almost all intervals, and this is certainly quite a strong statement, almost all intervals of length h have a prime. You might ask whether every interval of, th of this length has a prime, and there are, there are conjectures of Cromer, but they are wild conjectures, whether we believe them or not is another matter. But the almost all we must believe, because we believe the Riemann hypothesis. All right, now, this theorem can be essentially proved by a much weaker conjecture, which is much closer to being proved. And that's the density hypothesis. So now let me tell you what the density hypothesis is. So there's the line and a half where the zeros of the zeta function are supposed to be. <coughs> and let me look at the following in boxes. I'll go up to height t, and I'm going to count the number of zeros to the right of sigma, where sigma is any number greater than or equal to half, less than or equal to 1. We know there are no zeros of zeta to the, light of, to the right of 1 and on the line 1. And I count how many zeros there are here. Okay, and I want to explain what this density theorem is. So it's denoted by nt sigma, the number of rho, which are, usually we write the zeros as beta plus i gamma, such that beta is greater than or equal to sigma, and mod gamma is less than or equal to t, and of course the Riemann zeta function at this point is zero. Okay, the number of zeros up to height t in, in the whole strip is about t log t, so this should be zero, right? The Riemann hypothesis says this is zero if sigma is bigger than a half, and the density hypothesis is a statement that n t sigma is at most, and now you should be looking, the key thing is it in a linear interpolation in the exponent between the two obvious bounds, and that's what we're going to be generalizing throughout. So, on the line 1, there are no zeros, so that if sigma were 1, it should be t to the 0. On the line a half, I'm getting all the zeros. So that's t log t, and I'm going to be a little crude here, with t to the 1 plus epsilon. So it's going to be 2 to the 1 minus sigma. Plus epsilon. These epsilons you can ignore. This means, this notation means this is less, less than a constant which depends on epsilon, epsilon is arbitrarily small. So just in your mind, put epsilon equal to zero there. It's not exactly true, because if I put epsilon equal to zero and sigma is a half, then there are t log t zeros, not t zero. But this linearly interpolates between the two trivial bounds. And the interesting thing is, uh, this theorem of Selberg is very easy. You write down the explicit formula that Riemann wrote down for the number of primes, you integrate, you compute what you get. And the interesting thing is one zero off the line can't hurt you in this problem when you're shooting to a small interval. If you're asking for the error term in a big interval, each zero can hurt you. But if you're looking for very small intervals and you average over the intervals, one guy can't hurt you. So this statement here tells you that there aren't too many zeros off the line to the right. And that's what a density hypothesis is. And the interesting thing to save time, I won't write the exact thing, same thing, but the density hypothesis implies essentially the same. What? The statement is for every sigma. For every sigma greater or equal to a half, including a half, and for every t, yeah. So uh, if I, well, a half doesn't, it's not so important. If I put that, the, the empty set is bounded above by that, but the important thing is as I move a little bit away from a half, I decrease with the exponent linearly. And that exponent decrease is balancing something else exactly on the nose, enough to make the following conclusion, which is all I want to point out. So if you follow Selberg's proof and you analyze it carefully, this is all that's needed, slightly weaker result. So you can prove that density hypothesis implies V of X is less than or equal to H squared, which is not so interesting, times 
Okay, you will need to know what's happening on the line one to get this, uh, what I'm about to state with the variance, and that's a prime number theorem, so I'm now inputting a non-trivial bound for the prime number theorem, exponential minus whatever the world record is. Now, I don't think I'm going to put in Vinogradov here, but... <coughs> um, Funny. Seems to be missing. It's probably somewhere. I was preparing this the whole of yesterday. Okay, well, uh, it's something like e to the minus, I don't know, square root log x over log log x. Anyway, it goes to zero, and this is if x, if h is bigger than x to the epsilon, slightly weaker for any epsilon not logarithm. And that's clear because I've only got an epsilon here. If, if I made a stronger statement here, yeah, I could improve this. In any event, the upshot of this is every interval of length with h, an arbitrary small power of, of x, almost every interval will have a prime under the density hypothesis alone. Now, this density theorem is not known. This linear thing in between, uh, um, so notice the exponent has this linear form. Something a little weaker is known like that. So there are techniques to prove density theorems. We have very little towards the Riemann hypothesis, but we have theorems towards a density theorem. And so this uh, does lead to theorems which are non-trivial about almost all intervals with quite short with something one six or something. I don't know what the record is. But my point is to uh, point out to you that in certain problems, it's not a disaster if there's one zero off the line. And then if you can bound the number of bad guys, you can still get the optimal result that you might be interested in, as long as you're sh shooting for sh small sets, optimally small sets. Okay, um, in this particular problem, there is, as I mentioned, this conjecture of Cromer, which, uh, you believe it or not, uh, it's, I, I don't have any strong feelings about it, that every short interval of length log to a power will have primes, every short interval, but if we generalize this problem to higher dimensions, the almost all statement will always, I believe, remain true. But the individual statement can, immediate, can start to fail. And let me just give you one example. And that's going to be very important because I'm going to look at this in the context of Ramanujan and Ramanujan graphs and higher dimensional complexes and things like that. And there it's very relevant for, our, for this conference, I believe, anyway. So suppose I look, instead of ordinary primes, I look at Gaussian primes. Because now I can equidistribute in the plane rather than on the line. So I'm looking at z square root minus 1, and I'm looking at primes p, which are just prime numbers in the Gaussian integers. So Hecker proved that the Gaussian primes are equidistributed in sectors. The number of primes of norm less than x in a sector is proportional to the area of the sector. At one of Hecker's big theorems when he analytically continued the Dedekind zeta function of a number field. So you can ask the same thing. If I take sectors here which are just uh, slightly bigger than the area is just going to infinity very slowly, does every sector have a prime of norm less than x? So is there, are there infinitely many primes in, in sectors which are growing like log x where I'm looking like before? maybe even dyadically, at primes, prime ideals, whose norm is less than x. And the answer is, uh, if you assume the Riemann hypothesis, or even the identity hypothesis, then almost all sectors of the very smallest size, just like we saw here, will have primes in their sectors. But there's repulsion. Uh, you can have sectors which are of size. There are sectors of area x to the half, this is completely elementary, rather than uh, log x to a power, which have no integer points, <laughs> no primitive integer points in the plane, never mind Gaussian primes. So I there's some structure there which is repulsion of two po lattice points at this tiny scale. And so it's not true that every sector of the small size has a Gaussian prime. But the almost every continues to be true. So the minute you go to higher dimensions, the only thing you can expect is this almost covering. 
And that's an important thing. It'll be connected to the almost cutoff for remanagent graphs in a second. So, so uh, it is not true here. It's provably not true. That the smallest sectors have primes. Every, that every, but almost every will follow from a density hypothesis, have primes. And this is a warning, and it's going to be clear in a minute. So if you want to formulate Kramer's conjecture in this context, you would have to first remove these repulsion. Uh, nobody's ever formulated it, I don't know. I think there's a student of Rudnick who might have asked to formulate it. But, but if, it's, you, it's if you leave out those sectors that simply have... Then no it may be true. They have no integer points. That's one way to try to reconcile it. Yep. That's one way. Yep. So the model of that little discussion was that the density uh, theorem, the density conjectures, firstly one can make progress on them. I should say there's a very famous theorem of uh, Barbon, uh, Davenport and Heilbronn, which says that if you look at the Q analog of primes in progressions and you average over the, the progressions A and over Q and you ask about this variance, you can actually prove that it's true unconditionally. Well, the famous bombieri vinogradov theorem says that uh, if you're looking at the Q analog with a double average, the analog of the density with even maximum, not even average, but even a maximum inside is true. So it's well known if you read anywhere, people will say that the bombieri vinogradov theorem often serves as a substitute for the Riemann hypothesis in certain kind of problems. And they are always problems where you're looking at small sets where it's extremely powerful. All right, so now let me turn to the topic that I think might be more directly related to uh, everybody here. And let's talk about Ramanujan graphs. And there's a well-known result of a couple of years old, although, and that is the following, that uh, one has sharp cutoff. I think some of you like this, sharp cutoff. I'll explain what this is in a minute. Uh, this, I think, is due to a student of mine, Sardari. I think he was actually first. And Perez and Lubetsky. Now, he didn't look at sharp cutoff. It's going to be a similar question to this. That is, the almost diameter is as small as it can be for a Ramanujan graph. Namely, 1 plus little o1 log to the base k minus 1. So these are all going to be k regular graphs. So I'm assuming they're Ramanujan. Of the number of vertices of the graph x. So just by cardinality considerations, just like here when we were looking at how many points we're putting in boxes, you can't do better than one here. And the almost means that almost, if I take, uh, for almost all points, if I fix a point, the for almost all points, I can get to every other point in this distance, but almost every other point, not every other point. So almost all points can be realized in this diameter. Uh, in many applications, this is this, uh, there's a version that they describe, which is a sharp cutoff of, of a random walk, uh, that, the fa that the transition, the cutoff is ha happening exactly at one times this. Uh, for me, it's just going to be this di almost diameter. The actual diameter, much to Nati's disgust, the actual diameter of Ramanujan graphs that uh, Alex and Ralph Phillips and myself constructed many years ago, the exact graphs we made, the Cayley graphs, is got the same feature of this higher dimensional. There's a big hole. That is to say, they are only four over three times this. In other words, there are actual points that you have to, that the shortest path is quite a bit longer. Four over three times that for the Ramanujan graph. So the almost all statement is true. It follows from Ramanujan. So almost all, almost all points, they have every 
No, so, no, no, no. So for every point, almost all points are seen. So for every point, almost all points are seen by this. The you can, once you get to this diameter, you've seen almost all the points. And then it drops off very quickly once you go between there and 4 over 3. By, you get, by the time you get to 4 over 3 times log, um, we expect that's the true diameter. That's not proved. Okay. So that follows from Ramanujan. That uses the Ramanujan property. However, this can be proved with a much weaker statement. A density hypothesis suffices for this exact statement. And that's uh, the point I want to make here. And let me state the density hypothesis for a graph. So for this, um, I want to remind you the way I think of these k regular graphs. So the eigenvalues, as you all know, are between uh, minus k and k. And then the Ramanujan property is minus 2 root k minus 1. I don't want to use this notation, two root, uh, plus 2 root k minus 1. And that's the property I'm assuming about the graph. k is fixed, and it, the cardinality is going to infinity. Um, if I were to get a universal cover of this graph, that's a k regular tree. And that's because I'm going to state a general conjecture for an arbitrary group arbitrary semi-simple group that I claim is completely always universally the same statement. So I want to interpret it already from that language right now. So if I go to the k regular tree, say 3 regular tree, and I look at uh, a function which Laplacian is the nearest neighbor, Laplacian phi plus lambda phi equals 0 on the tree, there's a unique solution which is radial about any point called the spherical function. There's a unique solution to that equation which is radial about a given node. And that satisfies an ordinary difference equation and the fact that it doesn't blow up at the origin makes it one-dimensional and that makes it unique. And it's got a decay rate which depends only on lambda. So I'm going to call that decay rate, so I'm going to define P of lambda, and later it'll be P of a representation. P of lambda is the inf of it's how quickly it's decaying in LP norm. So it's a sum of phi of V to the Q, the inf over Q, such that the sum of phi of V, phi is the solution here, depends on lambda, the spherical guy, over all V in the tree should be finite. If there is no Q for which that's true, then it'll be infinite. Okay, so that's the definition of P of the eigenvalue lambda. So you can check that P of lambda is 2 if and only if lambda is in this interval minus 2 root k minus 1. 2 root k minus 1. If we, the constant eigenfunction, which is the eigenvalue at k, or if you bipart that and there's an eigenfunction at minus k, then your function's constant, then P is infinity. So P of K or equals P of minus K equals infinity. So now you can guess what the density conjecture should show, state. It's a weaker statement than Ramanujan. So the almost, the sharp cutoff, let me say it this way. is will follow already from the following density hypothesis for the graph that if I take the number of eigenvalues of the adjacency matrix of the graph the number of lambda j's which is the number of eigenvalues is the cardinality of x so the number of lambda j's for which p of lambda is greater than or equal to P. So this is the density hypothesis for P between 2 and infinity. The number of bad eigenvalues, the number of P lambda greater than or equal to P of the graph is at most the cardinality, the total maximum it could be, to the 2 over P plus epsilon. 
So it's, uh, it's, uh, the linear interpolation in this notation is in 1 over p. So for every p, so if p is 2, this would just be saying the number of eigenvalues is at most x. That's the trivial bound in the, on the tempered spectrum. And if we go to the trivial representation, it's going to be p is infinity, so then it would be x to the epsilon. So it's a linear interpolation in 1 over, two over, one over p between the two extremes. X is the graph. This is the eigenvalues of, of, of X. Yeah. So it's a quantified, uh, it's a, a relaxation. You, you're saying one eigenvalue can't hurt me on this problem. Two eigenvalues can't hurt me. Well, what's the maximum number of eigenvalues that can't hurt me? That. That is ex anything worse than that, and uh, you won't be able to make the conclusion. So the sharp cutoff follows from this. Okay, so you might ask, well, who cares about this? If you know the graphs from Manajan, th this is the empty set. So the point is that there are many situations where we don't know how to prove the Ramanujan conjecture, and we can prove this. And so we still get this optimal uh, diameter feature. And there are many more situations, and even coming from complexes, buildings, where Ramanujan is simply false. But this, I claim, is always going to be true, so that it's... A good black box thing. Now, to wake this man up, he always falls asleep in my lectures. <laughs> yeah, he sleeps and then he's got something stupid to say. Uh, <laughs> let, let me tell you, we once were going to write a book together. And we had a big fight because we knew Ramanujan in GL2. And it doesn't require any side conditions. And you can just say, if you're not one-dimensional, then you're tempered. This notion of p equals 2 oh, will be in a moment tempered. And we wanted, he wanted to state Ramanujan without saying cusp form, without saying all sorts of things that were poison to me. So we argued, and then he said, you write your book, I'll write my book. And we did that. And his book won every prize, and nobody reads my book. Okay, <laughs> but my book's correct. <laughs> it's got the right definition. But he's correct because I want to now formulate a, for, a formulation of this density where he can put it in his book and just ignore all the nature of the spectrum, Eisenstein series. This is the replacement which is universal, but it's not good for every problem. It's a substitute of certain type. Okay, so that's uh, in the graph case. Uh, this is just uh, a very easy exercise. Um, and, and it was observed already when I... Uh, I have a letter. Okay, so now let me give you an example, a concrete example, one I like very much, of where we don't know Ramanujan and where we uh, would use this density instead to get the full result. So an example, it's in a letter of mine to Sardari, that fellow Sardari. It's also <coughs> rediscovered or separately discovered by Kamba and Go Kamba Amitai and uh, what's your first name? Golobev? Yeah. That's not your first name. <laughs> okay, you can find it in a letter of mine. And it's the following. Let's look at SL2Z, the two by two integer matrices. This is where all the action is done. Think of general groups as being always the action. This is the action. So a sufficiently difficult group. Okay, we all know that if I reduce mod Q, call that pi, this is onto. And if you want some diameter in this version, it's the following is what's going to be the problem. The problem is, let me put a norm. So these are four, two by two matrices. So I can think of them in R4. So let me use a norm on on there, just the Euclidean norm on the 2 by 2 matrices. And the question I want to ask is, if I give you an alpha in SL2 Z mod QZ, there's a lift from this, there's a lift, alpha tilde, there are many lifts. What's the lift of smallest norm? I want to find the smallest guy which reduces to this guy. So I want the minimum of the norm of alpha tilde such that uh, pi of alpha tilde is alpha and then I probably want the maximum, the worst case 
over all alpha in SL2 of Z mod QZ. So the parameters Q, I increase Q. What's the worst size of the lift? Okay, let's see how it's got to do with this problem of balls in boxes. So, um, if I look at the elements in SL2Z, well, they just satisfy, they just integer solutions to this equation. How many solutions there are there with a norm of gamma less than or equal to T for some large number T? Well, if I choose A, I can choose A in T ways, D in T ways. So, they are T squared choices for A and D. And then B and C are essentially determined because the number of divisors, so B, B, C, will be 1 minus A, D. And the number of ways you can factor a number is at most T to the epsilon, N to the epsilon. The number of divisors of a number is at most N to the epsilon for any epsilon. So the total number here, I'm going to ignore the epsilons. So the total number of numbers whose norm is less than T is T squared. These are my balls. Now, three, throw these balls in the residue classes modulo Q. This is like computing the diameter. Can I hit every residue class with these T guys? Well, I don't have enough. The number of elements over here, the size of this 2 by 2 matrix group is about Q cubed. Again, I'm not getting to, into the finite arithmetic. So I better have that T squared is better, bigger than Q cubed, or I don't have enough balls. So I could hope, and this is... This is needed. So the best that I could have is T is Q to the 3 halves. So the, the best possible answer here would be that I can always find a lift which is size Q to the 3 halves plus epsilon. So there's the smallest lift should be no bigger than Q to the 3 halves plus epsilon. But just like in the Ramanujan graph case, there is a big hole. There are certain matrices which are, require Q squared, and you can give examples. The question is, almost all guys lift to something of size Q to the 3 halves, and that should follow from Ramanujan. But this Ramanujan is not known. So, theorem. Almost all alpha have a lift of size, I'm going to ignore the epsilons, of size Q to the 3 halves, but not all. Okay, so this is an extremely good example of where we don't know Ramanujan because Ramanujan in this case is, does not reduce to... So now maybe I should give a quick uh, rundown of when do we know Ramanujan, when don't we know Ramanujan. There are certain modular forms for which we know Ramanujan. In the cases we can reduce this to the algebraic geometry and use the Riemann hypothesis for actually in general varieties of a finite field is due to the lean. In those cases, we know Ramanujan, but the case I'm talking about now is exactly one of the cases where we don't know. We know damn good approximations, but they're not good enough for this theorem. But the density theorem is good enough for this theorem. So the actual thing here is that if you take the upper half plane and you divide it by the principal congruent subgroup gamma Q, so that the kernel of this map is called the principal congruent subgroup gamma Q. This gives me a Riemann surface. It's not compact. So many cusps. Got a lot of topology. So I guess I draw it like that. <laughs> it's got a lot of topology and a lot of cusps. And I look at the Laplacian on this surface. Uh, and its eigenvalues, the zero eigenvalue is the constant function. And then there's an analog of the Ramanujan conjecture of this P equal 2 is that there should be nothing between zero and a quarter. It's a very famous conjecture of Selberg. And that would be sufficient to make this conclusion by an argument which was straightforward generalization of, of arguments we know. But we don't know the Selberg conjecture. But there is a density conjecture known, yeah? So the density hypothesis is known, yeah? And that's what both of us both of these use. So this is due to Huxley. I'll state it in a second. I mean, it's, it should be clear what it's going to read. It's due to Huxley and Xu and myself. And it reads this. 
And now you can see how the general case is going to look. That the number of eigenvalues lambda j of delta on h mod gamma q p lambda j greater than or equal to p so p is greater than or equal to 2 and now what is p lambda j the exact same definition you take the upper half plane you make the eigenfunction spherically symmetric about a pole it's unique and you look at how quickly it decays and that defines the p just like it did on the tree so the tree in the upper half plane read exactly the same way so it's p lambda the number of eigenvalues that are between zero and a quarter or is trivially bounded by the volume which uh, was q cubed and so this should be better than the volume so this is less than the volume or the area in this case of h mod gamma q to the exponent 2 over p plus epsilon that's the density hypothesis and this actually has a completely elementary proof so that Xu and myself gave a completely elementary proof of this, basically, in this example. Huxley has a better proof, actually, because it's this which I think that'll generalize. That's what I want to point. I've tried to generalize this and failed, and uh, this looks more promising. And I want to explain that, actually, next. So the point of this is exactly this uh, replacement, that the density is good for this kind of problem, and it's a theorem here, yeah, and it's used. I should say there's a very interesting feature here. You could ask about finding this in polynomial time, finding this lift. You know that almost all guys have a very short lift by this theorem. Can you actually find it in poly log Q steps? And the answer is no. The problem's NP complete. It was proved by Ori and myself in uh, essentially this context. So there, but there is an algorithm which is in my letter on this which finds a path which instead of length q to the three halves, to find the optimum, to find the optimum, find the, good, the optimum. Find the good one, could be, could be. Uh, so the best algorithm known is the one in, in my letter, which produces a guy which is size q squared, which is, it might absolutely. It's only the absolute. I only uh, reduce it to the, the knapsack key. problem in a very. <coughs> in, uh, not for the optimal, and this is weaker than, and it's even weaker, uh, yeah, but it's weaker than what I have in my letter. I have a deterministic algorithm which is stronger than anything. In, a, in this case, works better than any other algorithm, including the computer science algorithm to navigate to a diagonal. You can make the same argument. Okay, uh, you can find that in my paper with the man talking there. <laughs> so you, but you can also find a, a Q version in the definite case in Sardari's paper. They're all a random reduction to uh, the knapsack problem. Yeah. Okay, so that's an example. But now let me turn to the general case. And I want to just formulate the general case and comment why I think this is actually A, generally true, and two, actually I think there's a chance of proving it. So um, I have, I think, I have till half past, right? I know this guy's very tough on. He's a half past, right? Yeah. No, no. Yeah, no, no. <laughs> I'm not going to torture you till six. <laughs> I can make sure they enjoy the dinner. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, all right. So uh, I want to now state the general case. Uh, this will include, uh, I'm, I'm going to state it just at the real place, but if you make a simple translation, you would get the case of Ramanujan buildings. And I want to point out that in some of these situations with buildings, uh, it is not true that the Ramanujan conjecture is true, the naive version that I'm going to put down now. But this statement of density, I think, is always true. And that's, uh, uh, so in general, you have to say that the cusp forms coming from GLN somehow or the only ones which are very kosher, and those are supposed to be good, but the bad ones we're supposed to understand. But there could be infinitely many bad ones in these situations. And the density theorem is the statement that the number of bad ones is not enough to upset this problem. 
That's exactly what the density would state. So I'm going to state it in the following sentence. I'll state, I'll state the congruence version because there are a lot of people who like limit multiplicity theorems. So I'll just take G, a linear algebraic group. You can think of your favorite group, SLN, but I'm going to make it compact for simplicity. So you can think of an orthogonal group defined over the rationals, uh, semi-simple. So GR will be the real points, but I'll just later just call it G. GZ will be the integer solutions to this, which is a discrete subgroup, so that I'm going to assume that GR over GZ, unlike this case here, which had these cusps, but everything I say has a version there too, it's just I want to state it in the simplest version, is compact. And then I want to take subgroups gamma of GZ, finite index subgroups which are congruent. So what this means, so this would be like setting up a generalization of Selberg's theorem, is a, uh, it's a, a, a group is a congruent subgroup, it contains one of these kernels of reduction mod Q. So they're not all subgroups. In some situations, these are all the finite index subgroups, but I don't need to. I'm only going to look at congruent subgroups. And then the Ramanujan, the naive Ramanujan, is connected with the following problem. So the spectral problem which underlies this, and you can find it in uh, Lubotsky's prize-winning book, <laughs> is you look at L2, G, G is GR, over gamma, yeah, I've got a chip on my shoulder. Yeah. <laughs> I take this homogeneous space, this Hilbert space, and there's an action of G on the right here. I take a function F in L2, and I multiply it on the right by G, and I get a new function which is still gamma invariant under the left. So if I just translate by G, so this is our right regular representation, I get a measure preserving, this is regular representation of the group G. And, so I, and since I'm assuming this is compact, gamma's finite index in GZ, this decomposes as a discrete sum. Well, maybe zero because the trivial representation is there. Of representations, m pi gamma, uh, and subspaces v pi. So these are subspaces of this which are abstractly isomorphic to a uh, representation pi here, where pi is, up to equivalence, a unitary representation of the real group. So we need to understand all the infinite dimensional unitary representations of G, or at least that's where the spectrum lies. And this is a countable sum, countable discrete sum, and these numbers are depend on gamma. And the theory of automorphic forms wants to understand this decomposition. This is extremely difficult, but that's what the theory is about. <coughs> and the naive Ramanujan that Alex wanted to put in his book, he does put it in his book, but he sticks to GL2, so he's safe, <laughs> is that if you're not one-dimensional, if you're not the trivial representation, then your P pi is 2, you are tempered. So there's this great dichotomy. This is the analog of the Riemann hypothesis. If you're not on... If you're not the pole at one, then you're on the line a half. And this is in any dimension. So it's got to be wrong. Because uh, somehow, uh, what happened to all the homology and the intermediate dimensions? So it looks wrong, but it's remarkable that it wants to be true. So the naive Ramanujan is that if pi occurs here, if m pi gamma is positive, so if pi occurs in this decomposition for some congruent subgroup gamma, and pi is not one-dimensional, this is, then it follows that pi is tempered, which means that p pi, this decay, means that p pi equals 2. Let me tell you what p pi is. You have a representation. You can take a vector in the representation. You can take a generic vector. You keep away from something that might be singular. Take a generic vector in the representation space, and you look at this function on the group G, and you ask what LP norm, what LP space does it lie in? And you take the least P for which that's lying in there, and that's the LP norm. 
That's called p pi. And p pi equals 2 if and only if plus epsilon. You, so it's the inf. So p pi is the inf by definition. And the interesting thing is that we know what these p pi's are in the Piadic case and the real case. In the real case, this is famous work of Harishandra. So if you just write down the decomposition of L2 of G, not G mod gamma, only the tempered stuff comes in. And so what Ramanujan says is you're dividing by gamma. It's just like with the Ramanujan graphs. You have this tree. The spectrum on the tree is something simple. And how do you make a quotient so that the spectrum of the quotient is no worse than the tree except for the one-dimensional representation? So naive Ramanujan would say this, but this statement for general G is simply very false. So I'm going to formulate what I believe is true. And it's basically a, just a variation on the conjecture of Xu and myself. And it's enough for many, many applications. And I'll end with a couple, some of which I'm expecting Golobev and uh, Amitai to do. <laughs> They're supposed to carry out some of these things, I hope. They say they are. Okay, so the general conjecture in, for this setting is this. But let me just remind you of a theorem of uh, one of your colleagues who left. Um, uh, so it's Finnis. He's not. Lapid. They have a very beautiful theorem that let's take the situation over here. And let me write down the spectrum of this for every gamma. So let me write down a measure. Let me write the following measure. I take all sum over all pi such that m pi gamma is positive. I put a delta function at pi, uh, where pi I now think of in the unitary dual. So it's a measure on the unitary dual, and I take one over the volume. And I take any congruent subgroup. And I take a sequence of congruent subgroups of the thing I started off with. So this is a not this is a finite measure. Locally, this gives finite mass, and it's bounded mass locally. But it's got no it's supported on the whole unitary dual, which is not a compact space. I look at these measures and I take their weak limit in the sense there's a topology on this, and I take the weak limit. So this converges to the Plancherel measure of G, only to tempered stuff. That's a theorem of finis Lapid. It's called the limit multiplicity. There's actually a much more general theorem in higher rank due to, I think they call them the seven samurais, of which there's some here, I believe, uh, that that's true without any assumption of being a subgroup of a given group, which is the case here. But the bottom line is that that theorem is proved using a trace formula, this theorem. This is the key tool. That we're, not, we're not tough enough to work with the Arthur Selberg trace formula. That's our weakness. They work with it, but they're really still doing very soft stuff. This is the statement. So this would say, because this converges to the tempered spectrum, that in a density theorem, which I'm about to state here, you can put a little o, and the density conjecture is you're supposed to replace little o by what you all know, a linear interpolation in 1 over p. That's the density conjecture, which I think may well be provable. And, and there are some higher rank situations where we know some of it. So he has a density conjecture, and it's supposed to be in small equidistribution problems, a replacement of Ramanujan, and it allows you not to say cuspidal and not to say oh, there are exceptions. So let omega be a compact, for this purpose, compact subset. I need to fix the subset, subset of g hat unitary of the unitary dual, so that's where the spectrum lies. Then the sum of m pi gamma and p greater than or equal to 2. Then the sum of m pi gamma greater than 0 uh, of the m pi gamma. Okay, this is just all of them where pi is in omega. So all those constituents which lie in my compact subset. And p pi is greater than or equal to p. So if p is 2, I'm doing nothing. I'm counting everything. And then uh, Lapid and uh, Finnis will tell me this converges to the Plancherel measure. In particular, it's bounded by the volume. But if p is bigger than 2, I'm expecting a power gain. So this should be less than epsilon. The volume of g mod gamma. 
to the 2 over p plus epsilon. So it's saying I'm allowing non-tempered guys, but their number is limited, and this interpolates linearly between the two trivial bounds. I should say, if you just take one pi here, not the sum of all the bad guys, this was already formulated in my paper with Xu, where we used that to conjecture and prove bounds for cohomology of locally symmetric spaces, because there's a formula of Matsushima which computes cohomology of these topological spaces in terms of these m pi's. And uh, we made a conjecture there, which for unitary groups in three variables was recently proved by Simon Marshall, using the full force of the trace formula and moving to GLN uh, and using... So the, one approach to this problem, so let me end with two comments. One approach to this problem is to assume the Ramanujan conjectures for the general linear group on cusp forms. I should say one of the most brave things Langlands did when he, formulate, when he was formulating the theory way ahead of everybody in the 60s, was to formulate the Ramanujan conjecture for the general linear group by simply saying that if you cuspidal, whatever that means, then you tempered. So that part, and that's a remarkable statement because if you know the vague conjectures, if you're a curve, then you have, there's only one cohomology group, it's H1, and you get square root and all the zeros on the line a half, it looks like the Riemann hypothesis. But if in higher dimensions, the purity conjecture depends on the Betty numbers of your variety. And they are in different dimensions. So when Langland said the condition of cuspidality is enough to just get you straight to the middle dimension, nothing else, it's very brave. But there's no doubt it's true. Uh, this con his conjecture is true. So if we assume Ramanujan, or if you're in the situations where one can prove it, and there are many situations where the Ramanujan building people who use it, uh, I think we'll hear from uh, Ori tomorrow about such a situation where you will assume you will be using Ramanujan as it's proved, then you can uh, get what you want out of this, but there are situations where you don't know Ramanujan simply because uh, you're not on a classical, uh, you're not on GLN, you're on a classical group, like a unitary group, and then you're of a type where there's some exceptional eigenvalues, and those exceptions are supposed to be few in number by this. So one way to prove this is to prove it conditionally under Ramanujan on GLN. That's one, and that's what Marshall is doing in some special case. That's, that's not a bad thing, but it's still conditional in general. Uh, on the other hand, the experience of when you can prove this in the two-by-two two matrix case is it's very easy to prove. I told you that Xu and I have a very elementary proof. Uh, it's just counting with your fingers. Unfortunately, when it comes to three by three matrices, that elementary proof, I don't know how to carry out, but the proof with a trace formula, I have a feeling is going to work in general. And so it would be good to have a very general density conjecture true, and then it can always be used as a black box without worrying about the subtleties. So the moral is not only that we can use it in cases we don't have Ramanujan, as a replacement for Ramanujan, but we can use it in situations where Ramanujan's false. Thank you. Just to see, that's right. So, assuming the density conjecture, then, uh, you, then you deduce this cut. Okay, okay. So, you, if it's homogeneous, and, and this is what Amitai and you are supposed to be doing in general, this for certain problems. This is a replacement. There's also a whole slew of problems that Amos Navo, Gorodnik, and uh, Gauche are working on about Diophantine approximation on homogeneous spaces, all of which they, they, they have a, a, a universal number, which is a constant coming from ergodic theory. It's the universal exponent. When they have Ramanujan holding, they know the exponent, and I claim this will tell them the exponent is as good as it can ever be in all their situations. But yeah. In particular, uh, just yeah. the cutoff. In sharp cutoff. Like also in the no. Of, uh, if uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. The sharp cutoff. Is, the sh the but I want to. I want to just with one caveat. So if you assume Ramanujan with the let's go back to the Ramanujan graphs. So I think we're all very comfortable. So if you have a Ramanujan graph defined abstractly, just its spectrum is in this interval, then it has sharp cutoff. When you uh, sharp cutoff, you mean? They in essence in in both in their sense and in my sense. No. Uh, no, no, the sharp cut off, no, no, their strong statement is slightly stronger, but the proofs are comp a variance computation. 
if the graph is a Cayley graph, then you can say for every x and almost every y, the diameter is small. But if the graph's not a Cayley graph, so it doesn't look the same at every point, then the Ramanujan conjecture will still say for every x and almost every y, the diameter is that small. But if, it's, uh, but if you only have this, then we only, the, the only natural thing that I know that comes out of this, and I think you agree with that, is that for almost all x and almost all y. So you have to center where you're looking at also. But if you're a Cayley graph, then you get exact everything you can from... So you lose no information. And that's because uh, when you replace uh, the, uh, the Ramanujan by this thing, uh, an eigenfunction comes in. Yeah. Okay, I'll stop. Yeah. So this, show, this is very strong evidence towards it because it's showing that you don't... So in their paper, Perez and uh, Lubetsky point out a, a weakening. They point out if you don't know, suppose the number of bad eigenvalues is uh, uh, cardinality of x to the epsilon. Then they can still get the sharp cutoff. But I'm saying you can assume much less because you're allowing not x to the epsilon, x to a power depending on how bad the the guy is. So when you're very near the tempered axis, I want x to the epsilon. When you're near 1, I want a much better bound. Uh, so, so it does indicate, I think, that that may... It's, I don't know. I don't know. No, no, I don't know. Because this is really uh, Still. for congruent subgroups. So if you want it for every expander, you have to look at the full automorphism group of the... No, 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 no. He's asking a purely linear algebra question. Suppose I have the density hypothesis for a, a graph. A K regular graph, and I write down that density that was written for graphs. That implies sharp cutoff, in the sense I just described, and that's much weaker than assuming that. Sorry, I, there's one thing I'm lying. I need to know it's an expander too. I need to. <laughs> uh, we know that in all these cases. We know uh, expansion. We know in every situation. So I'm secretly also. It's not just density. I also n need to know that. There's a, uh, a gap or some control, spectral gap, which is common in everything. Everything we do, the expander is completely understood now. So what's the question? So, there is a general graph conjecture. That any expander has sharp cutoff. Yeah. This means that somehow you can get the density... No, no, from the expander. No, 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 no. The density does not follow from the, from the sharp cutoff. The density does not follow from the expansion, no. No, I don't know how to prove density from expansion because I know expansion in every situation. Yet. Density is something else, and I'm just saying that you don't need full Ramanujan for sharp cut if you need something very much weaker. It's prob it may well be true. Yeah, I, I don't know. Okay, I don't know. Yeah. 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 Anyway, uh, the ones that come out of this, the, the almost diameter follows from this. My point is that that's a much weaker statement, provable, maybe in general. Other questions? Yeah. So this um, or Ramanujan class is not known whether a random graph is Say it again? Uh, I have a bet with Noga alone. Uh, we're probably both wrong. It's probably 51% of them are, are Ramanujan. I'm quite confident that's a number. I'll explain to you afterwards. Okay, it's fixed. Okay, it's fixed. And uh, yeah, yeah. There's a universal number co co coming from something called the Tracy Widom distribution, which says he's wrong and I'm wrong. It's not a zero one game. No. So who well, it's 51%, so he'll want me to pay. <laughs> it's definitely, it's skewed to the right. So, uh. Ah, good question. I don't know, I haven't thought about it. That's probably robust. Yeah, good question. 
sharp. Yeah, I'm sure the density is true because Friedman has proved this thing plus epsilon, so it immediately implies it. Yeah, density, much stronger version of density is true.